So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Top Talk session. I know you're in the wings there. Nigel, how are you, mate? I'm okay, Jay. Good. Great I'm to have you again. back. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, it's been we've had uh, we had our Christmas team out yesterday, team night out. So uh, we're, we're, we we enjoyed that, we're getting ready for Christmas. But I think we're still going to be busy right up until uh, a week Friday before we shut down. But uh, you know, it's definitely getting a bit festive around here. But it's also getting a bit colder in this church of ours. So I've got, I've got the heating on me. But great to have you back. We have, uh, we, we've had, well, I, I know I always request you by popular demand, but the feedback after last week's webinar, as always, was, uh, was you know, great. So I do love it when, when you're on with us. So I know we're going to sort of follow on um, from last week. We've started looking at architectural photography, but now we're gonna, this week we're going to be looking, well, we looked at cityscapes uh, and urban landscapes last, last week, uh, which, as I said, the recording will be live tomorrow on the academy but today we're going to be looking at um the the what, what you call them uh, is it the historic buildings have i got that right yeah i changed the title about th uh, changed the title about three or four times before <laughs> uh, deciding on heritage features historic buildings and everything else That's so it's quite a it's quite a broad it, it, it's quite a broad um uh, uh remit agenda really um so i'm, I'm going to try and narrow it down during the presentation brilliant now it's just because we do have some new people online with us i know we always do it and a lot of people are familiar with it. but just a little you know just a little bit about you before we get going mate and, I'll, and then we'll uh, we'll get into tonight's presentation yeah, uh, my name is Nigel Forster. I'm primarily a landscape photographer, although you've probably seen with my architectural work both this week and last week. And I assume there are a number of you with with us last week, um, perhaps some new people as well. So it's going to be a bit of bit of a mix, I would guess. Um, so we do quite a lot of a lot of architectural work, quite a lot of people on location work as well, a lot of interiors, that kind of thing. So I use the word um, landscape photographer very very broadly. I also uh, teach photography uh, throughout uh, locations throughout the UK as well and um, I might uh, do one or two little plugs for my workshops while I'm at it as well. Absolutely. I've been with a photographer probably about, oh it must be about six years Jane, is it? Yeah, I think Something it's like got, we were just chatting about I think it's got to be about six years. I think it's got to be a good six years and uh, mm, we're, we're probably has. We're definitely, we're definitely, definitely, uh, definitely going to keep you, Nigel. We, def we love you, mate. Stick out, stick out some of the first things we did and find out exactly what date it was. I've got a feeling the first no, filming was about six I'll years ago. I'll have a look now well, well, when you get mm. going. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Yeah. Well, let's not waste any time, guys. Don't forget that, obviously, we want you to interact with Nigel tonight. So any questions through the question panel for us. Uh, we've already yeah. had a few people saying, yeah, looking forward to this one. Enjoyed last week's. So I'll just feed that back to you now. Good but, Nigel, okay. I'll give you the screen because it's better for you to control it. So it's coming over to you now, and I'll let you know when we can see everything full screen. Yeah, so uh, click on the usual, and hopefully that should work. Yeah, I can see you in full screen mode. I can hear you nice and clear. So I'll go quiet, Nigel, okay. and then you just prompt me uh, for questions, and I'll prompt you if need yeah. Thanks, mate. It's all yours. Okay, will do. Good to hear, have you all here again. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, obviously, there's going to be a bit of a mix here. Um, Last week, I was de doing cityscapes and particularly sort of modern architecture. And I think one of the characteristic differences between uh, modern architecture and historic uh, monuments and structures and buildings and everything it encompasses is simplicity and, and, and clean lines. You'll notice last week, a lot of perspective shots, a lot of metal, a lot of glass, a lot of very striking, bold, simple compositions. Um, it's fair to say that um, historic structures, and I must think of a, a consistent um, uh, term for using, whether it's going to be buildings, heritage, or what have you. I think I might use heritage um, throughout this. You'll see there's nothing simple about it because a lot of them are ruins. A lot of them weren't designed. They were just knocked up. Um, so it's a very different style of photography, this. It's also got potentially quite a, a massive range as well, which I'm going to introduce things in that way as well, just to just just to go through what I interpret as um, my understanding of what this kind of particular field of photography um, uh, photography involves. Um, so that's going to be what I, what, what I do. As normal with my presentations, I try to kind of divided into blocks of three. So with this one, bit of an introduction, what the scope of uh, historic building photography is, um, how you might try some basic techniques, but I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one than I have done in previous ones on a, a series of case studies, because I think um, there's a danger with this kind of photography of just going through the basic composition stuff, which I've got on a lot of other webinars, has been covered in a number of times before, and pretty much that kind of thing is pretty much standard. I'm going to touch on it, but I'm really not going to spend much time on it. I think it's going to be a little bit more productive to spend more time 
on individual case studies and how I go about photographing particular projects. I think that hopefully you'll find that a little bit more helpful. Um, so uh, the cover slide, um, a number of you are going to recognize this, I'm sure. Um, it's Elian Donan Castle uh, on the west coast of Scotland, um, one of the locations I pop into on the way to my Sky Workshop. So always, always worth a visit and uh, happen to drop in at the right time here as well. That was uh, more by uh, design than luck, of course, but was fortunate to get uh, the decent sunset. So that's a classic, classic landscape shot, isn't it? But of course, it comes within the realm and the field of um, historic buildings and heritage photography as well, as a lot of the picture, the kind of pictures probably you're taking, you're taking do. Um, so um, what do I mean by heritage? A few basic ideas and a few case studies and examples. Another castle there, that's uh, Carnarvon, um, uh, Carnarvon Castle up in North Wales. Um, a lot of these castles work very well lit after dark. So you'll find a number of examples I've got here are actually uh, nighttime and dusk, because actually that's a lot of when these structures, particularly when they're lit, uh, come to their own. So it's something I do quite a lot of. Um, so what we consider, um, I guess that generally, when I'm photographing, whether it's for personal use, but more, more particularly for professional use, the kind of things I would consider when photographing um, a, a, a monument or a building or, or, or something, it's, it's, it's the context, the wide view, the, 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 the feature or structure in the landscape. It's the detail that I might want to pick out um, and its specific features as well. And of course, with that, it's both inter exterior and interior views, if that's what required. Sometimes, of course, um, they are just monuments in the landscape, but a lot of particularly stately homes, historic buildings, they're also interiors to consider as well. So a number of the examples I go through are also going to talk about, talk about how you photograph the best ways of capturing interiors as well. Um, as with all aspects of photography, consistency and composition. Think about compositional style, uh, one of my other presentations I've done in the past, a number of you may have seen this, is on how you can form a style in photographic composition, and particularly how you think creatively. Don't just go for the obvious. Variety of techniques for day and night photography. The, um, the example I've got below is actually a, uh, a, a ruin, a ruined church, a place called Kilmore in the Isle of Skye, and uh, it's actually one of the case studies I've used just to demonstrate the kind of ideas I've used uh, for this shot. That one happens to be a, a long exposure of about, I think it was about four minutes, um, to get some sky movement. And I'll take, I'll take you through that as we go, as we go through it. Um, as normal, what I will do, I'll also break um, on each uh, section if I think it might be appropriate to see whether there's any questions in the meantime, rather than have them all at the end, because uh, the tendency to forget questions by, you get, uh, by the time you get to the end, although I know, I know Jay does uh, collect them on my behalf. So what do we mean by heritage? Well, I've got a range of examples here. I'm not going to spend much time on this because it's, it's a little bit of an overview, but just to see what potentially actually you might include within uh, the remit of heritage photography. And in reality, it's actually an awful lot of the landscape photographs we actually take. Um, Fourth Rail Bridge, historic uh, monument built in uh, late Victorian times, uh, lit after dark. It's a great, it's a great monument. Commando Memorial, not too far away from that, up on, uh, up on uh, just above um, uh, Fort William in Scotland. Um, it's a, a, a dominant feature just off the main road. The Helvetia at Rosilli, uh, a ruin, a, a shipwreck, uh, 1857 it dates from. Um, but you can just see the tops of it. By the way, that beach, uh, if you remember, anyone remember the, the storms of January 2014, it revealed the whole hull because the beach got stripped, but uh, it's back to normal now. So you just see a little bit of a remnant of it. Uh, standing stones at the avenue in Stonehenge. Uh, it's part of, it's very near the, uh, the, the famous stone circle at Stonehenge. A few other examples here. A dam at the Elam Valley built during the 1930s. Battersea Power Station, now undergoing refurbishment. Um, Penarth Pier was down there last weekend and some, uh, uh, with a pretty extraordinary rainbow actually. Port Talbot Steelworks, we don't we think of uh, heritage perhaps being um, historic monuments, but actually maybe think about uh, our industrial heritage as well. And I've got a, a, a specific st slide on historic uh, uh, industrial heritage as well. Uh, Trotower Castle, very close to me. A quarry, disused quarry, 
in uh, Snowdonia, uh, just above Blyna Pistini, called, uh, called Camorthan. Um, some really interesting balancing ponds there uh, that were used as water uh, for uh, to service the quarry. Hadrian's Wall, uh, probably the most ancient monument I've got here. Um, Lindisfarne Harbour, Harbour with the upturned boats. So you can see there is a, a lot of um, um, types of photography, and I could go on. This is just a wide cross section, uh, but equally I could name more. So you could actually see broadly you've got a, a very wide range of um, different subject matter within this remit, and generally it can capture much of what we deter what we visualize or what we determine as being landscape photography which is why i'm going to primarily focus on specific projects because i think you'll gain more from it um, one thing i'm not going to do i've got a, a a slide here entitled composition ideas i know it's quite early jay but um is there any questions at that point the only question that i've there, got jay? so far and i sorry I couldn't find my mute button. Um, the only question that I've yeah. found so far with regards to Heritage's sites uh, goes back to about access, really, so far. It's like, are mm -hmm. there problems sometimes? But that's why I hung on to it. I wouldn't have sort of asked it yet. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they vary, uh, don't they? Uh, some are paid sites. Many in Wales, uh, in England, English Heritage, in Wales, CADU, uh, or National Trust, of course, throughout the UK. National Trust for Scotland as well. Uh, many of them, many of the locations I've already shown you are from public, publicly accessible spots. A number uh, require paid admission. Uh, so it depends on, on the site. And even with CADO, for example, which uh, looks our, after our historic buildings in Wales, some, for example, Lantony are free. Uh, others, Chitaur I just showed you there, and many others are paid entry only. So there's a real mix there. The greater issue for photographers is commercial use of the images. Um, many of these uh, pictures, um, you've got to be very careful about what you can sell commercially. National Trust in particular, uh, particular is quite um, uh, 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 stringent in terms of its rules on commercial use. CADU generally, uh, if it's taken within CADU prem pro um, uh, uh, premise premises, can't be used commercially, or if you do, it's with permission. So it's some that's something to be careful of. That's it for now, mate. Okay, good. Right, um, composition. As I've mentioned earlier, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this because it does primarily repeat what I cover in other uh, webinars. But just a few uh, broad ideas. Uh, that's Trafalgar Square, by the way. And one thing that caught my eye in that picture, um, that kind of um, building, very classically designed, uh, very uh, classic ar classical architecture, I think on the whole, a um, a conventional approach, a classical approach, very symmetrical, with perhaps a, a modern twist to it, looking at the, the lettering in the foreground, the reflection on wet pavements. Wet pavements are very good. Don't dismiss particularly urban photography. And uh, when you've got pavements in the foregrounds, don't dismiss wet conditions because they, they are very suited to black and white. Bring out the, uh, the, the, the tonal variations, quite strong sky detail, but also the wet pavements work really well in terms of bringing uh, out the, the detail as well and reflecting the, the building. So wet, wet days, particularly in urban photography, work out very well. You'll probably notice that rather unusually, um, there are no people on Trafalgar Square, which is unusual. Was taken quite early in the morning. It isn't a long exposure, you can tell by the sky, because that's often one way of removing people. There are, I think there were about three people I, um, that disappeared as part of the part of the Photoshop process. So uh, I, I generally caught quite, quite a lucky moment there. But that's the kind of image which is really quite strong, symmetrical, uh, classical approach. So, um, a few ideas in terms of composition of um, uh, features and monuments. I've covered a lot of this kind of thing before. Positioning in the center of the frame. If something is right in the middle of the frame, the eye is drawn straight to it. I've either used foreground or lead-in lines or something that draws the eye to the feature, but right in the middle of the frame is generally what, what I would be using if I wanted to draw the eye straight to the image. Don't forget if you use the rule of thirds, then what you're doing is creating more context. You're ta effectively taking your eye 
from the main subject to its context. So there's a, a slightly different different emphasis to the picture. If you want the eye to be straight, drawn straight to a subject, then put it right in the middle, and you'll get you'll get maximum impact out of it. Um, uh, just to briefly uh, go over these while I'm at it, Avril von Trump um, looks a lot older than it is. It was shipwrecked in 1976, not that long ago. It's on the North Yorkshire coast. Uh, if you want to go there, down the road, about four miles south from Whitby Abbey. Whitby Abbey is the picture I've, the feature I've there got in the bottom corner uh, on the, in, in North Yorkshire. And it's a great site, but obviously make sure the tide's out. Uh, when the tide's in, you might get a little bit wet. Um, so Black Nab in the background, Avril von Schopp shipwreck in the foreground. And it's an old trawler. So if you imagine it's being Victorian or even older than that, no, it's not. It's not that old. My clear standing stone, it's a monument um, in, uh, in the Brecon Beacons, taken as part of a long exposure. Dodo stones are in Northumberland, um, and it's a really good feature. Keep on meaning to go there at sunrise or sunset, actually. Uh, but Northumberland's a long way from me, so unless I'm up there spe uh, specifically, it's uh, yeah, I've got to capture the right moment. As I mentioned, Whitby Abbey. Um, perspective compositions. Um, that's um, the um, picture I showed you again, taken on Trafalgar Square, uh, and a couple of others which have very strong, simple, straightforward, very symmetrical perspective compositions. So these work quite well with classically designed buildings or structures, whether interior or exterior. Um, it's fair to say that a wide angle lens is pretty much usually a pre prerequisite for this kind of shot, simply because they have um, impact that, that str those strong perspective lines taking the eye from foreground, uh, away from foreground to background. Um, and um, viewpoint or position you take the picture on is really important as well. If you look at the um, the two on the right hand side, they're taken, taken from pretty much the same height with the uh, a line in the middle, um, a horizontal line and everything else coming from each corner. So they're very, very precise and precision, particularly when you're dealing with architectural photography, whether it's modern architecture or classical architecture is very important. Um, so when you're when you're looking for symmetry be right down the middle but be aware of the exact height you're taking the picture from because everything else will um will will it will really show if you're slightly off with these um there's an element of perspective correction needed as well partly lens correction but also sometimes a little bit of perspective correction in post-processing too uh diagonal compositions any of you have seen my uh, my photography before and the other presentations I've done, I use diagonal compositions quite a lot. Um, you'll also notice all these are black and white as well. I do a lot of black and white work with architecture. It's, uh, it's that, that those the, 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 the tonal variations work very well with with that with structures, buildings, and uh, in 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 monochrome. So I use diagonals quite a lot with the main diagonal running across the uh, the picture and other diagonals uh, leading to the shot. It's quite a dynamic approach. Uh, architectural patterns. You'll see a similar similarity within these two. This is looking very much more at the the detail level as opposed to the uh, the broad broader context level. So both modern architecture and historical architecture tend to work. Big buildings or big big terraces, long terraces, tend to work on the basis of of repeating forms. It's how they were built. It's how they were built. So try and reflect that um, that in your photography. Um, mixed lighting. So, as I mentioned on a number of occasions, I use um, uh, light, uh, a mixture of lighting, so taken after dark. Best thing about this one, by the way, it is a fabulous place. It's, as I mentioned there, it's the Elizabethan Manor House in Shropshire, a place called uh, Wilderham Manor. Best thing about it, you can stay there for a tenner a night. Uh, it's actually a youth hostel. So, just because it looks posh and plush on the outside, the inside, a lot of history, but anyone who's ever spent any time in a youth hostel knows that perhaps the inside isn't as carefully looked after as the outside sometimes. But it does mean you get to stay in a wonderful building, and it has got an amazing, it's got a dungeon, it's got a fabulous uh, staircase going down, and it's a pretty extraordinary place. So uh, well worth a visit. And the great thing about staying somewhere, of course, you can just pop out early in the morning and get uh, a shot, and I happen to catch uh, the night sky in there. A little bit of a problem with light pollution, 
Um, one of the things you'll find, particularly with buildings, um, is that uh, this was taken early in the morning. For some reason, the, the, it's not the, not everyone got up early. This was taken about uh, half past six in the morning, about six o'clock. Not everyone was up. Rather bizarrely, they left, they left all the lights on all night, and I was the only one in the building apart from the caretaker. Um, which was uh, interesting. So I actually had that whole building to myself. Anyway, so you've got, I've got the specification there. You'll see it was taken with a wide angle lens, um, shot at 13 seconds. When you're shooting stars, don't go beyond 20 seconds because you'll effectively turn them into uh, lines of light. And what you really want is the, star, uh, the spots of the stars as well. Bump up the ISO as much as I needed. Quite a lot of recovery and post-processing needed there. You can see the original for, raw file on the bottom left. And um, the perspective corrected version, a panoramic version on the top, I actually quite like the dynamism of the uncorrected version. Um, doesn't necessarily go with the classic straight, classical straightforward uh, approach of modern buildings, um, but I actually think it works much better than what the wide view when I've corrected the perspective. Uh, perhaps others of you might think differently. As I say the raw file, you can see the original is quite dark, but if you've got uh, if you're shooting in raw, um, if you're if you've got um, uh, imaging software where you can lift the highlights, and I suppose suppose the quality of camera is actually quite important with this kind of shot as well. Shadow recovery is so much better, particularly with a full frame camera. So it's something to something to make, something to be to be mindful of. Um, going back to Kilmore Church, um, this is uh, an example of a church. Uh, it's in uh, it's a derelict church. As you can tell, it's only got three sides to it. It's got no roof. It's got no wall at one end. Uh, it's simply a shell. But uh, the great thing about it is its great location. Um, a lot of our uh, buildings of this type work really well if they're in isolation. Very uncluttered background. And this is a great example of it. You've just got the land and you've got the sky. Those of you who live in, um, in flat parts of the world, Norfolk, for example, or anywhere in the eastern half of, half of England, they're great for skies. And they're great for uncluttered landscapes and like isolated features. I'm sure you've all seen that the windmill shops taken in places like Norfolk. And they're great for this kind of shot because you've pretty much got an open view. You can orient yourself anyway without clutter in the background. Um, and you, for that reason, you've got a great amount of control over the shots. Now, uh, coming on to this, um, the, the shot in the uh, top left hand, uh, top left and top right. One's a black and white shot, one's a color shot. I tend to do a lot of these in black and white because the tonal variation, I think, on the whole, works better than the blue and white sky. Um, but that's a classical 60-30 proportion. In other words, it's not at 45 degrees. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a straight on. You're taking effectively the angle of 60-30, which is actually when, when, for example, you see a lot of um, architectural design work, a lot of the 3D uh, 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 um, uh, illustrations of architectural work tends to be on a 60-30 uh, elevation or, or, or angle because that's generally where they're perceived as being their best. Now, I actually move myself around on this shot to capture more of the cloud. You can see the shot on the bottom right is actually more effective. And it's far closer to being side on to the building than I would normally do. But I think it works better. And that was a bit of a surprise to me because the convention says go for a 60-30 uh, angle. But I think I prefer in this case, I like the, the, the just the light catching the front of the building. Um, and it's got a more almost a more dynamic effect, clearly helped by the fact I've got more of the sky content in there as well, which is the original reason why I turned around to get more of the cloud movement. So I was quite pleased with that shot. Uh, long way to go if you want to go up there. It's right at the top of the sky. Uh, I was up there uh, a couple of months, oh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago on my uh, my sky workshop, but it's 600 mile drive from me, so it's a, quite a trek. Go up there a couple of times a year at least, though, because it is a fabulous place. Um, so yeah, uh, just explore angles. The last one uh, was uh, the smaller picture on the right hand side, uh, lower right hand side, was simply watching the sun go down. I don't think it's effective. I think uh, as effective as the others. I think the church looks a little bit shapeless from that view. I took it in that view simply because I wanted to capture the sunset colors. So, uh, but uh, looking at it, I preferred the preferred the others. You'll see I, uh, with all these, of course, with any long exposure shot, uh, use of a very dark neutral density filters uh, filter. 
um, looking at it actually, the screen was about five minutes. So the one on the bottom right was five minutes long, showed you the sky was, the cloud was moving quite slowly. Uh, Pierhead building in Cardiff Bay, uh, familiar to many of you, of course, not too far from the Photographer Academy uh, um, offices, those of you who have been there. Uh, and pretty a pretty famous building as well. Just shown this really as a comparison between, again, another long exposure shot, but the original color shot, it is over-processed, uh, but I needed to over-process it for the black and white conversion. So the original shot, the red, red wasn't as strong, the sky wasn't as strong, but that was the first stage in processing, not because I wanted to show it that way in color, but because that way I would bring out the best of it in black and white. The other two black and white examples are simply two uh, alternative presets in using um, uh, Silver FX, which is a specialist black and white program. Uh, not one to plug particular brands, but I thought as well might as well mention it. Um, it's 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 part of the Nick software package, um, and you can see the very different uh, uh, example you can get through either getting a strong texture in the pavement in the, in the paving in the foreground, or actually you can turn it very dark. So think about one, which one you want to use. I think the one on the uh, left-hand side, and if anyone who's used this software, comes up with an awful lot of versions. Some of them are great. Uh, some of them are truly, truly awful. Uh, but you can usually find one or two which are okay, and it gives you the option of um, of varying each one as well. Personally, I tend to do the basic processing in uh, Silver FX, then take it back into Photoshop and do any final edits, because I, I think you've got more control doing it that way. An alternative here showing uh, color or monochrome. I think uh, generally you'll be shooting in color right at the outset. Um, so shoot all your, all your color images initially in RAW and then do your black and white conversion uh, in, um, in, in post-processing. Um, don't forget that black and white, two things lead to variation in tones, of, of t in tones in black and white. One of which is light and dark, very simply. The other which is color. Each color channel has got a different effect on black and white tones. So you've got an enormous amount of control in post-processing. So um, with this one, obviously St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, location was good because of the reflection of the pavement. Again, you'll notice another wet pavement shot. Do not dismiss um, wet days uh, for wet pavements. And also look at the texture in the sky as well. So some really quite bold, dramatic sort of uh, lighting in that. I like the black and white version. I think it suits the, it's got a feeling of very gr a grittiness of history, uh, of, of mood, which certainly in my mind, the color version uh, doesn't have. So um, yeah, uh, shooting color, uh, but generally I've got a really, a, a pretty good idea what my black and white, uh, whether I'm gonna prefer it in black and white, and I'll perhaps use a different uh, mind thought process for shooting in black and white because I'll have a different end product in mind. Um, so um, just a couple of alternatives. One thing though, if you're shooting commercially, most people do not like black and white pictures of commercially. They tend to go, tend to go for color. So see your black or white work as your fine artwork. See it for creating your own images. If you sell images, great. But if you're shoot, doing commercial shoots, generally black and white, most most of them just aren't interested in it. Most of them go for color. Uh, oh, I've reached the case studies. So uh, any more questions, Jay? Are you there? Jay, are yeah, you there? You caught me off guard. Sorry, Nigel. I was uh, answering a question in the chat panel, and I, I keep okay. getting where my mute button is. I should get better at this. You think I've been uh, doing this for long enough now, mate? To be fair. <laughs> Um, we've got some uh, we've got some general questions for you. you. Might as well ask them now before we get too far into it. Um, yeah. I know we did. I think was this came up last week. But uh, um, grads and filters. What type of grads and filters do you prefer, Nigel? Do you use any stoppers in any way? Well, uh, I think I've been through a pictures a few pictures there, which include a number of stoppers, uh, ranging from four stops to about sixteen. Um, anything uh, requiring uh, so all the long exposure shots. I have used a, 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 a dark neutral density filter of some form. Uh, and the strength obviously, obviously varies depending one on the light level and two on the length, length of shutter speed you're intending to use. The length of shutter speed will primarily, if you've got clouds in the picture, uh, depend on the speed of cloud movement and the light level. 
so yes, I use um, um, uh, um, dark NDs, I say in a variety of stops. And a lot of them, yes, if, particularly if you're shooting against the light, don't forget that the foreground is normally much darker than uh, the background. So uh, you'll typically be using um, a neutral density filter as well. Choice, if you've got a flat horizon, flattish, flattish horizon with a clearly delineated uh, uh, horizon line, particularly when the light source, usually the sun, is uh, towards the horizon line itself, usually a hard graduated filter gives you more control. Um, uh, if, uh, a, a, but a hard graduated filter can be very difficult with architectural photography or when you've got strong stu structures going into the si sky simply because it's already dark and you'll already you'll you'll uh, also be already darkening it even darker and it can make it to a point where shadow recovery becomes impossible often in that situation a better choice is to bracket and blend them in post processing so either you take two pictures one for the foreground one for the background and uh, and blend them afterwards in two separate photoshop layers very easy uh, and very quick you just have to just make sure you use the tripod or, um, or or take the pictures very closely together and just blend the two. Or um, these days, the automatic HDR function uh, in um, in most of the post-processing packages works very well as well. It's not the, like the old grungy HDR look you used to get, which um, seemed to, for some reason, have some level of popularity. Uh, it's uh, very subtle and works extremely well. So uh, they've all got pros and cons, these method, methods. Brilliant. Uh, again, I think this was a question that came up last week, but we should ask it again now. Um, tilt, shift, tilt, tilt shift lenses, perspective lenses. I, 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 I think there was a Freudian slip there, Jay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yes. Um, and um, I use one when I'm going up to when I can fit what I can within 24 millimeters in a full frame. But uh, I don't have one, a wider one, which sometimes I need up to 16 millimeters. I think I said, yeah, uh, mentioned uh, last week uh, that uh, if you're um, certainly I know Canon do a 17 millimeter. Nikon have just bought out a 19 millimeter, I understand, which costs an absolute fortune. Um, but if you're going very wide, I've, I've got a 16 millimeter standard lens and often find I got more control and a wider angle of view if I simply use my standard lens, uh, keep the uh, camera as upright as possible and simply correct the verticals in post-processing. Uh, my 24, which is the one I've got at the moment, um, isn't quite wide enough for a lot of the work I do. So it does restrict the angle of view quite a lot. Use it when I can, but on every occasion. But Canon uses, you've got more scope. If you've got a, tw as they do a 17 millimeter, I know they do. Brilliant. Uh, this is uh, quite an interesting question. I think you have touched on it again in previous um, uh, webinars, but uh, often we're seeing the images either at, uh, you know, uh, dusk or dawn. Do you prefer the golden hour or hours? As a general, I, I mean, some of them are. A lot of the black and whites uh, mainly are not. Um, don't forget if you want striking light, from above, often you'll need elevation of the sun with sending light down from above. So it depends on the situation. Uh, the golden hour has got a, uh, a, a or a, you know, to, to dark, to dust, a golden hour has certainly got the changing light quality. It's got the light color. It's got strong shadows. It's got a sense of drama. It really does depend on the, the subject. What I would say is that places like, unless you've got a very high elevated viewpoint, um, places like London, uh, where you've got a lot of high buildings and you're surrounded by high streets aren't a lot of good in the golden hour unless you've got a very clear view. For example, if you're on the Thames, on the Thames and the sun happens to be rising, rising or setting in the right place or just catching the light in the right place, often you simply, the, the light just won't, pen, won't penetrate that kind of, uh, th those kind of buildings. But certainly with these kind of shots where you've got a feature in an open landscape, then yes, the golden hour can, can, can be, Yet, yet produce some quite striking effects. As with everything else in photography, it really depends on the situation. I'm certainly not an absolute advocate of the golden hour. Plenty of my shots are taken all sorts of conditions. Brilliant. Um, this is more of a comment, really, rather than a question, but it was interesting when you were talking about um, perspective correction. Um, Fiona, who's with us tonight, had an image in a camera club competition and she was corrected for 
not doing it, but she didn't do it because it added a spooky atmosphere and was the story she was trying to tell. So it's interesting, isn't it, how we all look at things differently and sadly sometimes... Tell her, tell her word of uh, word of advice, Fiona. Don't listen to the judges. Do what you think is best. And that's exactly why, where I was going there. You know, it, storytelling yeah. should be yeah. equally as important um, absolutely. You know, in the judging yeah. as it is, you know, the, 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 the yeah. technical. And there yeah. are times where you absolutely yeah. make the rules. So, yeah, well, she's just... Mm, quite. For sure. Uh, that's it for a minute, Nigel. All back to you, mate. Okay. We have reached the case studies and specific project examples. Uh, so I'm um, going to go through these in a little bit more detail. Timing seems to be going OK. Right, uh, Clyther Castle in Monmouthshire. Um, I'm not sure crenellated is the right word. I think it could be. Um, it's a folly anyway. Very interesting building. It's owned and managed these days by the Landmark Trust who, uh, who take on historic buildings and monuments. And uh, they um, let them out. As um, effectively some very nice upmarket uh, holiday uh, um, lettings. Um, I've done done work with them for about the last uh, 18 months. A variety of projects. Two of them I've got I've got here. Uh, quick plug for, plug for them. They have got some beautiful properties. If you want to look them up, uh, well worth staying and staying in some of them. Um, so um, yeah, uh, Clyther is uh, not too far from Raglan uh, in Monmouthshire built in 1790 as a, as a folly and it's quite interesting it looks as though from it uh, that area in the middle is is part of it um, is, 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 is actually a part of the building but it's actually just a corridor and the building is nothing like as big as it looks from the outside because it's got it's got no structure in the middle it's a quite quite an interesting one uh, but it has got enough rooms to be rooms to be a holiday cottage bit of a classical approach this one uh, framing um, so while I what might not use in modern architecture, I will be very unlikely to use uh, a scene framed by trees. It does, and with that kind of foreground, it does work quite well with that classical historic architecture. It's a very different approach. So I've got a number of examples here. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to go from context through to detail, and with this one, some interiors as well, uh, just to show the kind of approach I'd take. So. Uh, this one, flat light, flat light's great. You've got no problem with sun in the lens. You've got no problem with light and shadow. You've just got, you've got, as it was taken in May, some great, really strong colors. Um, and you just bring the sky tones down. So photography in this kind of, uh, uh, this, these kind of lighter conditions, it's very, very straightforward. A bit like wedding photographers' um, preferences, much easier to manage the light. So you can see within all these context pictures, lots of trees surrounding the building, surrounding the, stru uh, uh, surrounding the um, structure. Um, I've tried to capture it from a variety of angles. And as I mentioned, the lighting conditions gave, pretty much gave me free reign of that. So when around a, quite a methodical approach. Um, firstly, um, the outside views, looking at the, uh, the angles um, from, uh, from, from, all, from all sides, um, made sure that the grass was cut beforehand. In fact, he was mowing the grass, grass that was, do it, was doing it. The shot on the bottom left is a panoramic merge, uh, which I've got an example, which I've, uh, from the individual images to the final shot on one of the next slides of this. So this is very much the wide, the wide view. Uh, verticals corrected, uh, because looking up to the building, um, there'll be uh, some um, some distortion there. Uh, so yeah, a lot of framing, a lot of classical classical views really. Uh, details, so both inside and out. And uh, the one in the middle on the top is not uh, a distortion in my picture. It's actually the shape of the window inside the building. So slightly all over the place, but it was built in 17 in 1790. So I suppose that's uh, that that's some reason. Uh, so uh, just a few interesting details. So uh, no definitive thing to say there, other than when you're going around the building, have a look, have a look to see what specific thing you want to pick out, and make your compositions quite simple. Make them focus on precisely exactly what you're photographing, and nothing more. So one's got a view in the background. One's a, two of these are very symmetrical views. So make sure when you're taking them and cropping them, you're taking them symmetrically. You're taking them and, ju and just capturing and just including what you need to include in the picture and no more. The staircase is also, as you can probably tell, pretty much all over the place as well. It was uh, very, very distorted. That's looking down with a wide angle lens. Uh, interior shots. 
Uh, so I think I've got, let me just check. I might have, an, yeah, I've got another slide on this one. So uh, I noticed a nice view looking from outside uh, the main door into into the building with one of the towers in the background as well. So I captured a picture with the door open looking looking outwards. The dining and kitchen area was circular. So the best way of capturing that shot was to take a merged picture which blended the image, which, which made it very clear it was a circular structure. Very, very difficult to capture that with one shot, but the use of a wide angle merged emphasized the curved lines. But what it has done, as you can see, is to also curve the paving. And on the original shot, the, the flooring rather, the uh, flag, flagstone falling, flooring on the original shot that was not curved so if you're shooting this kind of shot commercially what i would normally do is to take two i take both an individual shot which captures as much as i can with the widest angle lens from the corner of the building but also take a merged version because it doesn't suit everybody and not everyone's keen on it because it is a very distorted image uh the uh one in the middle at the top i've got a uh, a detail of that one and three so a bedroom, a couple of bedrooms and a bathroom, generally taken from the corner of the corner of the building, uh, because it uh, the corner of the room rather, uh, because it maximises that impression of space. Uh, usually, looking across, if you've got a bedroom, looking across the beds, not from the beds, and looking out, so you've got that view outside the windows as well. In many situations, the window, the light through the windows is going to be much brighter than the light outside. Uh, beg your pardon, the light inside. So uh, there are, you're either going to have to blend images, or what I normally do is to underexpose, deliberately underexpose the interior so I can hold the light in, the highlights in outside, then bring back the shadow detail in post processing. Bit of a trick, to be honest, but it works well. Uh, and bathrooms, bathrooms are awkward because toilets are never attractive looking. And somehow, what angle? What's the best angle to include a bathroom? Um, one th couple of things to pick up on as well: um, lights. Generally, put the interior lights on. The only problems that lights that can be an issue is, as shown by the one in the kitchen, the pendant light in the middle. Center, center lights are an absolute headache in, in in shooting interiors. If you turn them off, they become even more obvious than you turn them on. Um, if you Photoshop them out, well, they're actually there, so it's not really realistic to uh, to Photoshop them out. There's not a lot you can do with them. They're an absolute headache, uh, central lights. Uh, just thought I'd uh, provide a little bit more detail uh, from the original image to the final image on uh, that um, that 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 shot of the interior. So it's a very symmetrical shot and actually quite a nice sort of classical arrangement. So you can see there the original shot. Uh, taken into uh, the processing software. A uh, few things on it, underexposed, as I mentioned. I underexposed that one because I didn't want to blow the, uh, the lighting uh, on the table lamps. Otherwise, that would have blown the detail. Didn't want to do that. So I underexposed it by about a stop and a half and then brought the, the light back into the, into the room afterwards. You'll also notice that it looks quite distorted on the top one as well. So quite a lot of lens correction involved. And there's various things in the way, including, can't really see it very well, but, inclu but including a fire hydrant in the alcove on the left-hand side. It's so dark, deep in shadow, you can barely see it now. It was fixed, I couldn't move it. <laughs> so I actually had to spend about an hour removing it in post-processing. Uh, there's also one or two intruding elements there as well, which I've removed in the final version because they really don't enhance the picture. So the table, the chair, all that kind of thing, I've simply reduced that to a simple image in the uh, bottom left-hand side. Um, it was just a, 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 an arrangement whereby it was difficult to move the, uh, move the furniture around, so I had to do a lot of it afterwards. The one thing that has, is absolutely clear in, um, in uh, 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 interiors, everything matters, and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, in a moment. So uh, this is a few, uh, couple of examples of uh, how you can correct uh, verticals. Um, to uh, create uh, a you know create a different effect. So you're shooting up to the air, shooting away from the camera. You can see after uh, uh, you need to, to 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 get that proportions correct. You need to uh, to correct it in post processing or use a um, uh, a PC lens, of course. 
with this one. Um, this is a panoramic photo merge to give a wider angle of view as well. And you can see the original images look, uh, look quite interesting but uh, the processing software is clever uh, in, in, in that respect. Uh, and that caught, captured the, uh, the, 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 the framing of the leaves on the trees as well. Some of the leaves were quite interesting. Uh, they certainly weren't native trees, a lot of these, uh, although these, these were sweet chestnuts, but they had a really interesting uh, collection of trees in this, in this property. Very green, it was May, and everything was extremely green, which uh, must admit, it, you look at this time of year and you don't have to think, oh, it looks very, very different, doesn't it? Uh, so, second case study, uh, West Blockhouse. It's an interesting one, this. Um, um, West, as in one word, Blockhouse is another, not as I first called it when I went to photograph it, which is West Block, one word, and House, another word. Um, so, built in the 1850s, and it was a, a fort to fend off um, uh, the, the uh, French, potential French invasion, invasion, which, of course, never actually happened. Um, probably because they put a fort here, I'm sure they must have fended it off. Uh, another one owned by Landmark Trust. Um, so, uh, and a really difficult one, this, um, both in inside, incredibly dark, but also getting uh, strong uh, views as well. So I've got uh, some examples. It's right on the edge of um, a promontory. Uh, promontory. Oh, I haven't actually used the one I intended to on here. Um, there's one where you can walk down the coastline and you can see it um, standing out overlooking this coast, but it's actually not a very good view, but it shows how difficult this uh, location is. Um, so anyway, I took it, one from behind, the path looking down to it, there's a couple there with a, uh, a ship going, a cruise ship going past, and also a panoramic photo merge, which really gives an impression of, uh, of you're taking it out from out to sea looking back inland so effectively i've got a 180 degree angle of view there because i've got the the the, the sea both sides so uh it creates quite a strong feeling of uh, feeling of space so those are the context views i have though missed one out which does give an idea of how difficult this was because it's effectively stuck right on the edge of a cliff and you can only see it from from back on if you if you go further down the coast and look back onto it uh, a couple or a few details I picked up. Um, it's got a little lighthouse going down to uh, down from it, um, and um, it is very much a fort. So uh, it's built very very solidly. Uh, so both the, uh, the entrance door, both inside and out, um, it's got um, it's got a uh, a, a, a raised walkway as well. So you've got the winding winding gear, which dates back from the original date uh, that uh, was built in the 1850s. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's um, it was very much uh, very much very much protected from invaders. I assume though, if they got as as close as they would have done before they reached that timber walkway, I think maybe they'd have already been in trouble. Um, the one on the right is an HDR. Uh, so you can probably tell it's got that slightly H, slightly HDR look to it. But I tried processing in single image, but actually the HDR worked quite well. Um, about four, I think it was four images blended, different exposures, and just to uh, balance the two. So it gets, gives an impression of both the detail outside and into the shot. The uh, spiral staircase, very narrow and winding, really difficult to go, to go up an incredibly steep staircase. Each step was about a foot high. Uh, so that goes up. And the classic spiral staircase look, uh, just to uh, upwards looking down. And the interiors, probably the most difficult part of this, uh, this, this uh, site, they were dark. Um, and uh, if I'd actually reproduced them at the same light level as they originally were, um, I think not too many people would have been attracted to, uh, to, to stay there. I should point out the work I do for the Landmark Trust, they are, um, it's, it's about promotional material for their uh, for their for their for their website and promotional use so you've got to make it look uh, look good they, they they although they often want me to portray it exactly as I see it but sometimes when they get the pictures back they realize how dark the rooms actually are so uh, one on the top left you can see it's another one of those distorted interior uh, wide view pictures um, and that is a characteristic of that kind of shot which you either you accept it or you reject it and as with all the others, I gave them um, an alternative, a single shot of the wide view. They actually ended up using the wide view. Um, so interior shots, both the living space, a bit cluttered in truth. The living space is a, it's not, it looks lovely on the outside, but inside, yeah, I think it needs a bit of, bit of rationalization. 
A uh, few things on here to note when you're doing interiors. As I mentioned earlier, they are very, very uh, precise. Everything shows. So you'll notice on this picture here, uh, the dressing table is not positioned in the center. And one of the table lamps, or in fact both of them, are slightly wonky as well. So these things do stand out. Um, there's even the glass glass jar made with water in it. Is that a good or a bad thing? Probably don't want it. But the main thing, of course, is the fact that this, the dressing table is slightly askew. Um, hands up, didn't notice this, this until after I took it and got it back. Uh, so um, we all make mistakes. Uh, so what have we got? Yeah, like that, asymmetrical features. Um, litter bins, classic. Number of times, it's really easy to forget a litter bin in the corner. And in a photograph, it stands out like a sore thumb. Crumpled bedding, um, another problem. Make sure the bedding is absolutely smooth. Uh, wonky light shades, as I mentioned. Uh, lights off, they really do show if they're off. And generally, you need the lights on, partly because visually it looks stronger, but also uh, you, uh, you can have some very dark corners, which light the lights can be very good at filling, at, at, at evening out the light as well. Um, Open doors with a clutter outside, done a few of those. Leave a door open, you find there's something else in the corridor, like a hoover or, or something like that. Reflections in mirrors. Don't forget that when you're shooting towards a mirror, normally you will reflect, be reflecting yourself in a mirror. Blown windows, classic example, uh, where you've got, as I mentioned earlier, you've got a lot of light coming outside and it blows the window. So make sure you've got a one way, whether it's an HDR or whether it's underexposing and making sure holding the highlights, maybe uh, your um, your, 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 you'll need to do you'll need to do one of those. Um, there are many more. As I mentioned, uh, interiors are very very precise, and everything anything that's at all wrong really does stand out. Marks, I've had to spend a lot of time uh, almost repainting a room in Photoshop because there've been so many marks on the walls, uh, which are not well sometimes apparent when they're and thing, but it's not my job to clean the house, or clean the walls, or repaint the house. So you end up removing a lot of stuff, uh, marks on the floors, marks on the carpets, that kind of thing happens a lot. So be prepared. If you're doing this kind of work commercially, be prepared to allow a lot more time than you think you're, go you're going to as well. Curtains can also be easily, easily crumpled as well. So you do have to be very precise in terms of, uh, in terms of what you're capturing. Uh, spiral staircase. Um, I love the staircase. Uh, anyone knows Heel Depart Heels Department Store in uh, Tottenham Court Road? Uh, pop in when you're there and have a look at the Cecil Brewer staircase. Great thing about it as well, uh, they love you photographing. It's not like a lot of these places where they really object. You've even got the customers going up and down, but they, and there's not too many because it's right at the back of the shop. And the staff are wonderful. They're really good about it. Um, they, uh, they're quite happy just for you to photograph all day and just, um, just uh, use the pictures, which is, uh, which is great of them. So if you do go in, make sure you have a cup of coffee or a a soup or something like that in the restaurant because they they do deserve it um so uh, yeah it's a great place i run that's where i when i run my london workshops i normally take people in here it's it's not difficult photography but people generally are really like the results because it's quite easy to do just put the camera down the middle make use of the spirals and um, you'll get some uh, some very interesting effects don't forget to look down from the top up from the bottom um, and think about your positioning of the spirals as well, but this is quite a good example. London's got a few of these, but this is uh, probably the most accessible one. Uh, the monument at uh, Six Bells. This was constructed in 2010. Um, made uh, designed by a chap called Sebastian Boyson to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the 48 miners who died at Six Bells Colliery, which is just outside Abertillery. So it mix, it's a mix of context shots, shots the one in the top right hand corner. Uh, trees have grown since I took this, by the way. But also, it just shows a variety of way, angles and ways you, you, you can take this kind of picture. Uh, diagonal shots making use of the lettering, a close-up of the, uh, the head. I quite like that one because it brings out the texture um, of the, uh, the metal work as well. It's, it's, uh, it's a uh, patinated um, iron work, by the way, so it's, it's effectively designed to go rusty. As you can tell, it's a lattice. And he's, so he's about 20 meters tall, tall. He's about the same height as the Angel of North, but of course hasn't got his presence because he's not on the A1 just outside Newcastle, and of course hasn't got the wingspan either. So it just shows the different, way, different ways you can photograph a particular, a particular monument. Uh, Bamborough Castle, pretty well known. A uh, couple of shots there, all context shots. Like most castles, very hard to photograph, very close up, because they are quite shapeless. They are quite formless, 
and uh, very, I've got very few good pictures or strong pictures of details and close-up of castles. They tend, on the whole, I think, particularly ruins, uh, although Bamber is actually quite a complete one, um, to look better in context. So there's a few examples, one taken as the sun was coming up, one taken making use of the foreground when the sun was a bit further, so the foreground lighting up, uh, the sun lighting up the foreground, and one taken from the uh, causeway uh, up to uh, Lindisfarne, so looking back on, onto uh, Bambra with a very, very long telephoto lens, so that was about 600 millimeter lens uh, in total. Well, okay, th taken a th 300 and cropped, but equivalent to about 600 the way, is what you can see. Uh, quite a nice um, sort of backlit effect. You'll typically get that effect if you're shooting against the light and you'll get a sort of receding form. So the light, the, the, the light gets lighter as you look away from the camera. So it's quite nice shooting against the light. So that's more about looking at context and, 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 and scale of the image. Iron Bridge, just a few shots taken um, of Iron Bridge. Difficult one to photograph. Generally, the few views taken from the road aren't much good. You've got a lot of traffic, lot of stuff in the way, all for the big planters and all sorts of things. Uh, and um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a difficult one, difficult one to photograph from the upper level. So I tried to uh, look at different ways I could use foreground, use angles, uh, one from the side, one from below with a diagonal looking up, and one making use of the colorful, um, colorful floral display as well. Not great pictures, but it just shows you, uh, shows you different ways. Just think about how you can photograph a feature like, fe feature like that. Uh, industrial heritage, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that perhaps, perhaps often forgotten with uh, heritage buildings is in industry. And sadly, it's diminishing. Um, so our tra certainly traditional heavy industry, Port Talbot Steelworks on the top right, face closure a couple of years ago, but uh, was saved. Uh, so just a, a shot uh, I've, I've got of that. And it's a, it's a great location with the M4, so you're looking above the M4, looking down onto it there. Um, the other two uh, both taken in both taken in Birmingham. Uh, so Birmingham's still got some bit, but not too much in truth. A lot of that's going as well. So uh, get our industrial heritage while you can, because it's rapidly being re replaced by some rather faceless, soulless business parks. And finally, one of the top uh, top right is the um, uh, the ooh, it's at Porth Maddock, and it's got a particular name. It's a slate mill. And I can't remember the name of the slate mill, and I bet there's somebody here who can. Anyway, it's just outside Portsmouth in Snowdonia. Uh, foreground of slate relates to the mill, so it's a kind of fairly standard classical composition. A uh, couple of other things, finally. I'm just repeating uh, the slides I showed you last week. For those of you who were with me last week, on perspective correction, you can see the on the Tyne Bridge, the uncorrected version with the wonky tower. Make sure you correct your verticals with architectural photography. So. I think that's it. So um, this is pretty much pretty much the uh, ooh bit of a score by error on this one. I've used the same text as last week's. I should have adapted this because I've uh, I think I put a line of remember you're interpreting the designer's work and of course most of these weren't designed. So uh, yeah, this is actually the text from the last slide of last week's photography. So it's last week's uh, presentation. So uh, my summary has got a bit of a little bit of a score boy error. With that, I'm finished, Jay. Oh, brilliant, mate. Well, you haven't finished because we've got some questions to ask you there, mate. But um, okay. but no, another uh, jam-packed hour, so loving that. Um, we had a couple of questions, Nigel, uh, similar, so I, I rolled them up into one. Um, we were asked a few times about, well, you did touch on it, on actually on that fort image about uh, the use of HDR. So you, uh, the, the question actually came in when you, when you were talking about uh, the wind, you know, when you showed the, the 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 processing of the windows, the three windows, the symmetrical windows. Um, yeah. The question at that point was, would you consider using HDR? Um, so, do you use it much? Not much. No. Generally, you find in most situations, you given um, the capability of the processing software, and particularly the um, the sensors of high end cameras, the um, the recovery. Uh, particularly in shadow detail, is absolutely immense. So I'll often sh bracket with the intention of blending images, but end up only using one of them because I can find I can recover the recover the data with uh, data out of one image. So I tend I end up nah, no, don't often use it. Uh, but um, there are occasions in which it does. Um, it's very easy to use. It's, it's simple, 
press of a button in um, either a Lightroom or ACR these days. It's got it built into it. Uh, those of you who are using packages like Affinity, for example, not quite sure whether that's got uh, uh, that's got an HDR function contained with it. My guess is it probably has, uh, but uh, they are very easy. But uh, generally, I'll use a single image when I can. Great. Um, so on a similar note, um, do you do much with focus stacking? Nope. No, I didn't think we did. But... <laughs> Next question. No. And particularly with this kind of photography, no, it's a very, very limited, uh, limited um, uh, application. Uh, more appropriate, really, to a lot of macro work, really. Or maybe, and even then, if I do, on occasions, if I've got not not got enough depth of field uh, for uh, to get depth of field, in other words, close to the camera and in the distance, I'll take two images: one for the foreground, one for the background, and blend them rather than focus stacking. Only need two. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, this came in a few times actually, and I thought it was quite interesting actually. When we were looking more at the interiors, when you're talking about the interior features and photographing interiors, um, do you use any fill-in flash knives at all? Very, very rarely, uh, and certainly not interiors. You've got to be really careful with it. Um, it certainly bounces it off um, off walls and ceilings, so bounces it behind you to even the light out. But you don't want shadows as a result of it, so you've got to be very careful how you use uh, how you use um, flash and interiors. I try wherever absolutely possible to uh, make use of available light supplemented by the available artificial light in the room whenever I possibly can. Um, this this is the, the, the well at the minute it's it's the question uh, to finish with at the minute as you you answered a lot as you went and I did st strip them out because I knew that you would answer quite a lot of them as you go which is always good uh, but I thought this was good though um, okay so best I'm going to read it out it's a little bit it's, it's, it's just a bit longer the best deep red sunset I have ever seen was walking the dog on Bamber Beach um, and I didn't nah. have my, I didn't have my camera so the question yeah, is. I've got an Go on, Go on. We're going to be touching on next week's presentation now. Go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the question is, how many times would you typically visit a location to get the shots that you want? Obviously, you know, location, obviously. You... Yeah, I think we've touched on this one before. I don't often do it. Um, uh, there are places I know and I've been to a few times, but I won't generally, on the whole, go to revisit locations over and over again to get an ideal shot. Um, I, I, yeah, there are places, for example, I, I've got loads and loads of sky pictures because I've been there a lot. And inevitably, as you're there a lot, you tend to, and I teach up there, so I tend to be showing people stuff. And therefore, you come back with with a variety of images. But I'm not one to day after day go to a location for the hope and get the perfect shot of it. I, if, if, if I don't get it, I don't get it. And there are many places I've not got, you know, sort of, but I've, I've never been to Paul's Call Lighthouse. I've never seen Paul's Call Lighthouse, but everybody, everybody, who go, you know, who go, goes down to Paul's Call Lighthouse to get a picture of the crashing waves against it. I haven't got one, so it isn't the kind of thing that appeals to me particularly. So I mean, you know, you're capturing what you're there when you're there, and as you said, there are places yeah. that you visit. So yeah, absolutely. I suppose if you walk in a dog and it's something that you do regularly, then oh, yeah. you know, it would absolutely. make sense that obviously it, you know have a camera. But I appreciate carrying the camera. But believe me, I've I've been I've been there as well. I haven't got a dog, but um, yeah, I've been without a camera. And uh, I mean, I, a, there was the most awesome sunset. About uh, I'll touch on this next week, but I might as well mention it now. About six weeks ago, and I was down at Southern Down, um, just near Southern Down. I was teaching down near Bridge End. And um, and the light was as grey and flat as you could possibly want. I thought, oh, there's no point in doing that. So I made my way back home. And on the way back home, and everyone saw this sunset because there were pictures all over Facebook that, of it that night from all over South Wales, was the most extraordinary red sky you've ever seen in your life. And I happened to be in just about a perfect spot for it. And I just went home and I was stuck on the A470. So we all do it. No, we we do. all do it. I'll, I'll, I'll leave them with a great story. I was uh, driving up to Salisbury Cathedral. I, I, I do I do shoot a lot of the, the churches and stuff. And I'd never been to Salisbury Cathedral and I fancied it. And it was just after we'd had a bit of snow a few years ago. And I can't remember exactly where I was driving, but I was driving around this country lane. And there was an incredible shot of a, a lonely tree in this field. And and I thought, that's you know, I've got to take it. But it was cold. It was snowy. And I... And I'm, you know, I want to get off the icy roads. And again, you know, I know where this is. I'm going to shoot it tomorrow on my way back. 
and I stopped where I thought I was on the way back, but I couldn't quite see this tree, and I'm thinking, well, it must be, you know, in the next field, because I'm in an opposite direction. Well, four fields later that I've walked through, Nigel, I realised that I haven't stopped in the right spot, and I have absolutely no idea where I am, um, mm. and at that point, I never got the shot again, so maybe I should have just thought, right, it is cold, I want the shot, get out and take it, because the kit was in the back of the car, um, and I, but I thought, you know what, I need to get where I'm going, it was getting a bit dark, and it'll be better tomorrow, but no. So it's just one of those things in there. So I guess the moral of the story is, if you're Jay, don't be lazy. Get out. You've got the kit. Take the shot. Otherwise, you might not get it again. But often there's yeah. cases as well. You know, I, I can't I, – I, well, I'm a bit lazy now with the phones because they're so good. But I just, just tend to always normally have a small camera uh, in, my, in my car or, or with mm. me if I am traveling somewhere specifically. Maybe not my full kit. But then I guarantee you I'll get somewhere where I'll, I'll have something that I won't have. So I'll still shoot it, and, uh, and just so I've captured it. But um, I, you know, I, yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know if that was a good or a bad story. But yeah, the moral of the story. Well, Jay's story is don't walk through fields if you don't know where you're going, um, and, remember <laughs> what, and remember where your car is. That's always quite, yeah, yeah. quite useful. Yeah, no, that's that is definitely useful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, just oh, the image at the end, by the way, uh, is actually the uh, cottage I run my sky workshops in. So oh, this I thought little, it's, I thought this it's little gonna... Star Trail one there. So. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd put that at the end of the presentation. You've actually been Star asked um, to do some stuff about uh, Star Trails night, so maybe we'll do that in the new year. I don't know how we get yeah, it. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. I'm not a big I'm not a big Star Trail person, but I can take you through the ideas. I do. Whether I can fill an entire presentation with Star Trails is another well, matter. Well, we can do it as part of one, can't we? We don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, night, sure. obviously, um, we, we didn't touch on it, but we should. Uh, Christmas around a corner. If you want to treat yourself or you know somebody who might enjoy it, Nigel runs his workshop, so I've got to plug in Nigel anyway. But uh, any information on that, obviously, go to Nigel's site. I've shared it via, or get in touch with us, and I can pass that across. Um, but yep. uh, you know, incredible value for money. Uh, you know, it's easy for me to say, but it is, and the feedback we get from the people who do them is is phenomenal. Uh, Nigel, we're going to do one more before Christmas. We're going to be back next t Tuesday. Now it is Tuesday, mate. All right, next Tuesday. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to do um, capturing uh, sunsets and sunrise, I believe. Yeah, it touches on what we touched on a minute ago. Uh, uh, so, yeah, um, I'm not – I haven't got an answer to this. I wish I had, but I can hopefully give you a few pointers. Excellent. Well, brilliant. I'm looking forward to that. So that's next Tuesday, guys, at 7. And then next Wednesday, we will have the final photo critique of 2018. So if you haven't submitted an image already, uh, go ahead and do that. We love those images. There's plenty coming in, but uh, it will be. And uh, for, the, for all you listening as well, that slide has just uh, highlighted my branding issue at the moment. <laughs> um, you'll notice, <laughs> you'll notice firstly, that uh, the slides have got Nigel Forster photography on them. The other logo has got Creative Photography Wales and the website has got creativephotographytraining.co.uk. Uh, just a brief explanation of this uh, utter confusion. Um, the Creative Photography Wales is the name I've been using for a number of years. And my site, which is still live, creativephotographywales.com, uh, uses that one. Creative Photography Training is my new site, but I don't like training, so I might change that as well. But that's now live. So if you go into that site, it still works. It's still live. Uh, it still works, but I'm just probably going to change the, change the branding and name of it. And Nigel Forster Photography is the name I use for my commercial work. So, um, yeah, I do have a little bit of an identity crisis at the moment, <laughs> which needs resolving over the new year. But ultimately, Creative Photography Wales and creativephotographytraining.co.uk, you will find Nigel and you can get... You're, you're fine. You're fine. And yeah, you'll find me. Yeah. 